Is that the bunch? That is everyone. Okay. So then I would like a, a motion to adopt <laughs> no participation as written in the agenda, please. So moved. Second. Okay, very well. Roll call vote, starting with Pam is here again, so we can start with her and we're back on track. Pam Nurse Acton, yes. Sarah Montague Arlington, yes. Erica LZ Bolton, yes. Steve Ledoux, Concord, yes. Am I next? Yes, you are. Charlie Gabral Lancaster, yes. Sharon Musto Lexington, yes. Jeff Stulen Needham, yes. Alice Lucas Joe, yes. Very good. My understanding <laughs> is there has been no uh, public comment. Is that correct? That is correct. Very well. We move on to the consent agenda. Now, the way the consent agenda works is we take all the items together, and if there's a problem with one of the items, we bump it from the consent agenda. There's actually two minor changes on the minutes. So if there are no other changes on the minutes other than the ones I'm going to mention, then I think we can still do it with that modification of those two minor changes. So if there are any other changes to the three sets of minutes that we have here. We've had, I don't think we've heard of any. Can I ask one question on the July ones? Yep. Um, it says that the school committee goals um, under that section, it said that we were unable to achieve our That's goal. one of the two changes. Okay, so good. The two changes are exactly what you said. Under number 4A, it stated that the school committee did not complete its goals. That is incorrect. The truth is that the school committee did not set any goals. So that would be the first change is to change the statement from um, the school committee did not complete its goals to the school committee did not set any goals last year because we didn't. That'd be the first change. The second change is on the minutes of March 21st, the final action, I believe, was an action to adjourn the meeting, but it didn't state it was an action to adjourn the meeting. So we would add the fact that that was a action to adjourn the meeting. And those are the uh, two changes to the minutes. So yes. I'm, going, I'm going to move that we um, accept the consent agenda with those two changes to the minutes. So moved. Do you have a second? Second. Okay, very good. Any other comments on the consent agenda? Yes. Um, on the April 23rd minutes, it looked like under the item about Skills USA that there was a duplicate of information below the um, below the vote. It just looked, it looked like it repeated the two paragraphs from above. That's just a typo. Um, that would be in the April minutes. <clears throat> <laughs> April. It is April and um, the motion. It was that under the motion to accept Skills USA. Yes, it was right underneath the motion. It repeated the two yes. paragraphs from above. Okay, so this is the uh, duplicated. It was really two sentences. Uh, Ms. Jazin confirmed that they are com uh, compliance with all overnight trip rules and policies related to those things from the school district. Committee members wish the students good luck. That's just repeated twice. It's a typo. So I would add to the motion to remove the second, the repetition of that. I think we can do that without any um, major changes. Any other comments on the table, which is to adopt the consent agenda with those minor changes. Very well then, bring it to a vote, Pam. Pam Nosantin, yes. Sarah Montague Arlington, yes. Erica Elsie Bolton, yes. Steve Ledoux Concord, yes. Charlie Gabral Lancaster, yes. Karen Musto Lexington, yes. Jeff Sula Needham, yes. Alice Lucas Joe, yes. Okay, have we heard from Maggie, Julia? I have not yet. Okay. Then we will continue. Consent agenda done. So, uh, uh, Chair's report. 
Um, I'm, I'm going to ask the school committee to make a change in the order of the agenda. And the reason is that under item 6A and B, we have a guest. And that guest may want to get home, you know, back early enough to create like, you know, nachos in order to watch the debate. So I thought it would be a good thing <laughs> to allow those items 6A and 6B to occur after item 5E of the chair's report. Think that um, A through E will go reasonably quickly. So if there's no objection, I would like to make that one change in the ordering of the agenda to allow the items under the superintendent report, item 6A and 6B, to occur after the chair's report, item 5E. Is there any objection to that motion? Then I will say that was unanimous consent. Are there any um, items that I do not know about for the good of the organization? Yes, Charlene. I don't know if you don't know about it, but I just wanted to give a shout out to the Minuteman teams that have been doing so well. So girls volleyball had a great game against Kip. Girls soccer team won three one over Northeastern. Um, Boys soccer team won one zero over Neshoba Tech. Uh, there was a football win. I believe it was varsity football won over Roxbury twenty two to zero, and the JV uh, football team also won their game yesterday. So a lot of great wins starting of the seasons. Okay, that is indeed for the good of the organization that I did not know about. Are there any items, other items? I mean, I'm, not gonna hear, I'm sure we're going to hear a lot of stuff at the principal's report at the start of the school year. Um, Sharon. I was just going to say for the good of the organization that the, the principal did a lovely uh, presentation for parents, a nice q and It was really informative. There was a decent number of people there, and I think it was a really nice um, casual environment and setting, and people, I thought, asked some good questions. So that was really nice to be at. And you give him a good rating for his answers, Sharon. He did a good job. He was very open to all the questions, the good, the easy ones and the hard ones. Okay, very good. And yeah, we're gonna hear a lot more from the principal shortly. Anything else for the good of the organization? Very good. We move on. And now I think Alice is gonna have a uh, couple of comments, and I will also have a comment or two about a uh, past school committee member who recently passed on the wonderful, wonderful Carrie Flood. So Steve notified me about this and then um, uh, um, Alice and I were talking and then she found that great link that you were sent about her and Alice has a few words about Carrie Flood. Yeah, so <clears throat> many of us were lucky enough to know Carrie Flood. She was um, a member from 2011 to 2019. Um, I just wanted to recognize that she joined us during an incredibly challenging period when the district reorganized from 16 towns to nine. And she, when we were gaining approval for a new building, which as you know, was one of the first vocational schools in Massachusetts to be a new school since the seventies. I mean, people said it couldn't be done. So it was really, you know, a difficult, difficult time. And like a lot of people who become part of the Minuteman community, she became kind of immersed in it and dedicated far more of her time than we were reasonably entitled to. And I think be more than she thought she would be dedicating. <laughs> um, she, um, she probably gave us full-time use of her skills and she had a lot of skills and also managed her family life and did other volunteer work and held down a full-time paying job on the side. So <clears throat> it's really difficult to overemphasize the amount that she contributed. And you all saw the obituary. So you have seen the list of, of services that she performed in her own community from 1989 forward, every role practically that you can imagine in town government. And then um, <clears throat> here for us, she was an officer and a member of the finance subcommittee. And um, she was the keeper of the voting spreadsheet when we first started doing the percentage voting. And that was actually a pretty big deal because it was not always unanimous. Um, she was the chair of the regional agreement subcommittee when we had 16 member towns. Um, and we were one of the largest school committees in Massachusetts. I think we were the second or the third largest. Um, <clears throat> she was clever and courageous and strategic contributor and 
she rolled up her sleeves and she got to work for Minuteman when we needed her the most. And she was truly an incredible human being. Miss her. It's hard, it's hard to add to that, except to just say that nothing that Alice said was an exaggeration in any way. One of the best people I've ever had um, the pleasure of working with. Uh, great moral compass. And we could... You could send a note to her daughter who works for the town of Concord. Just a thought. Um, there also is uh, uh, calling hours. Um, I believe it's coming Saturday at D Funeral Home in, in uh, Concord from two to four um, for anybody who's interested. And there are donations that uh, they specified in the link uh, where to make donations. And so, yeah. So we'll take a very brief moment of silence and remembrance of, especially for those who really can remember uh, the wonderful Carrie Flood. Okay, back to work. We have talked, um, since about uh, June about the possibility of a uh, school community retreat this fall. And the thinking, well, actually we were thinking about it maybe during the summer and they said, that doesn't make any sense because Heidi should have a chance to you know, be engaged before we do it. And then um, I think early fall is not going to work out um, for a number of reasons. I think Heidi should be a little further along in setting her grand plan, which is going to present in February, a little further along that. And most importantly, the vote coming in November, if indeed the MCAS is eliminated, that's going to change the way a lot of things work here. And that would be a major um, challenge of our retreat. So I'm suggesting for our retreat is a half day on a Saturday in November or December. And what I would do is I would have uh, Julia send out, you know, the calendar uh, November after the election, actually probably mid-November through uh, December, list of Saturdays, and you send back which ones uh, you're available for. And then we'll choose one of them. And um, if we are ready to have the retreat at that point, then we'll have it, else we'll postpone it again. But I don't see... Um, the wisdom of, of having it on, on, because this will be a earth shattering event if the MCAS is eliminated, that will have a enormous impact on um, all the schools in the, in the state. And we better be prepared to talk about it then. So for that reason, I'm not gonna have, unless you have an objection to what I just mentioned, I was not gonna worry about setting a date tonight for an early fall rather than have um, Julia send out the request for late fall meeting. Does that make sense to people? Any objections to that? <coughs> okay, school committee goals. Um, let's see, Julian, could I share my screen? <coughs> I think I have them somewhere. Certainly. Let's go here. Here we go. Here. This is the work today. Go and share. Great. Can you all see those? Is it, um, let me make it a little bit bigger. Let's go to. So uh, where did these goals come from? Well, they came pretty much from you. So I said, um, uh, send in your goals, what you suggest goals for the school committee for the year. And we got, you know, a number of them. We took a look at them and and some of the things sent were um, didn't really come under the category of school committee goals, uh, but there were three things that uh, came out more than once. 
which was support the superintendent in her transition, increase enrollment and retention, and improve communication. Now, these are not meant to be smart goals and <clears throat> things that can easily be measured at the end of the year when we check off and you know give us a rating on each one. These are more a little bit more abstract goals, especially the last one, improve communication. Officers had a brief discussion of what does it mean to improve communications. We want to specify that, exactly what it means. And the thought was, no, there are a lot of places that communications could be uh, improved always. It's an ongoing effort. And we should leave that um, pretty vague instead of having a whole bunch of language and see what we are able to do over the year with this in the back of our mind. So these are the goals that came, they're rewarded somewhat, but they came pretty much from your submissions. And I'd like somebody to put a motion on the table to accept these as the school committee goals for the year, and then we'll have a discussion on them. So moved. Second. Very good. Discussion on the goals, and uh, you may have to, I don't know, um, yeah. I may not be able to see your hands, so you may have to, because Zoom is not really cooperating for me. I can't see all of you for some bizarre reason. I have tons of screen real estate. That doesn't help. That helps a little bit. Are there any comments on the goals, school committee members? I'll seem okay with you. Pretty straightforward. Yep. Very well then. Let's bring it to a vote. Vote. Pam okay. Nurse. Pam Nurse Acton, yes. Sarah Montague Arlington, yes. Erica LZ Bolton, yes. Steve Ledoux Concord, yes. Charlie Cabral Lancaster, yes. Karen Musto Lexington, <laughs> yes. Jeff Stulen Needham, yes. Alice Luca. Joe, 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 yes. Be <laughs> good. That was the easy one. Now the harder one. Let's see. Top share. Let me get the other one. No, no. Okay. Let's try this again. I think this is the right window. Okay, can you see this window? Yes. Yeah. Um, is it legible? Ish. Ish. Okay, let me try. It's just too small. How's that? Is that helpful? Uh -huh. Yep. Yes. Okay. So I think that there are a few comments and um, uh, changes required before we vote on this. So once again, these are the um, subcommittee assignments based upon what we had before and your requests. And I think that I got them all. So let's make sure that I got them all. There's one or two things I need to point out along the way. Uh, budget subcommittee is currently the same as it is this year. Um, Interestingly, the MFA negotiation subcommittee are the same people as on the finance subcommittee. But I know that Steve asked to join this committee and leave a different committee, so I, that's fine. And Sarah was brave enough to sign up for this one. Good. Uh, the policy subcommittee remains Alice and Sharon. Now on superintendent negotiations and evaluation, Maggie asked to be joining this one. I don't know, Charlene, you really want to be on this one if you're going to be on the new committee that we're going to talk about in a minute. What do you think? Um, if I don't have to be on it or I'm not needed, I'll just stick to the legislative. Okay, so we're going to take her name off here. So this is going to be as written, except for the changes that we make right now. That's one that's stuck in my mind. We have the Capital Planning School Building Committee, which is Alice, Maggie, and Fort Spaulding, a non-school committee member. 
You have a typo in Ford's name. There's no U. Where was that? His last name doesn't have a U. Okay. Didn't ask him if he wanted to remain on it, but unfortunately he's here so he could object, but we're not going to let him. Uh, enrollment, membership, access. Currently, that's going to be Pam as chair, myself. And um, as I, I mentioned at the beginning of this document, we don't have a new member from Bolton yet, which we hope to have in September. Erica, is that still likely? Yes. So I'm thinking that that person will be on this committee, you know, because um, everybody else has quite a workload. So I'm going to leave it as just Pam and Jeff for now. We're going to make a change on that later. And then we have a new legislative subcommittee. And uh, I know that there was a little change in this. Is that correct, Charlene? Is there a little wording change for this? Yeah, I think um, we had put upon the request, the last sentence, upon the request or at the direction of the full school committee, the subcommittee will also write or draft letters, not May letters. Okay, so I'm gonna actually read this. I'm gonna discuss this one for a minute because you haven't seen this before until we sent it to you yesterday. Uh, this scub committee works with the superintendent to review, track and address current state legislation and resolutions issued by MCAS and other groups relevant to vocational, career and technical education so that it may report back to the full school committee. It may collaborate with other legislative subcommittees from other division eight vocational career and technical educational schools, as well as attend MESC and or other events concerning upcoming or current legislation that affects vocational career technical education. Upon the request or at the direction of the full school committee, the subcommittee will also draft letters in support or against legislation or resolutions to promote the best interest of Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical High School. Now we have had subcommittees that have done this sort of thing in the past. And Charlene recommended that this would be, this is a number of months ago, recommended that this was would be a good thing for us to uh, do again, to keep in track of those sorts of things that are happening at the state level that's gonna have an impact on us. So of course I said, well, that's a great idea if, you, if you'll chair it, you know, um, so, you know, yeah, you, you, you make a suggestion, you got to, you know, get some skin in the game. So we didn't have enough time to go to the membership to, you know, do our normal process of um, adding you to this committee before today's meeting. So I'll probably ask for permission of the uh, um, school committee to allow in this case for the chair to appoint people to these committees, because I think we're gonna want this committee up and running before our next meeting. So what I'm gonna ask is for you, if you're interested in being on this committee, and I hope a few of you will, to submit your names to Julia. And as part of the motion I'm gonna to make to allow the chair on his own to, from that group, appoint the remaining members of this committee. So that's, I haven't made that motion yet, so there's no discussion yet, but there will be in a minute. The final one is the, that we're going to vote on tonight. We're not gonna actually vote on this one tonight, but I'm gonna mention it, is the General Advisory Board Liaison. Now, once again, you did not have this information early enough to decide if you wanted to take on this task prior to tonight's meeting. So we're not gonna vote on this one tonight. Instead, we sent you the information that describes it, describes your responsibilities in it, and we're going to ask for a volunteer to be the liaison to this group. Is there any school committee member who would like to talk about, bring a little this a little bit more to life to our membership, a little bit more about what it's about, all about? Pam. I served as the general advisory board liaison at one point, um, I think when I first joined the school committee and it was actually a wonderful way to um, 
um, you know, to meet people within the school committee, um, within the school family, particularly the advisory committees, um, just learned a tremendous amount. Um, and, you know, and, and it actually was really fascinating as, you know, the advisory committee members would bring their expertise in their in their various areas. It, it's actually a really interesting group to be a part of. Any questions to Pam, who has had experience doing it with Sharon? Sharon's on mute. Not anymore. Um, it says that the uh, general advisory board, like you would, this, this liaison would attend those meetings. When do those meetings usually be, or when are they usually held? Does anyone know? I think that I don't remember the schedule. Um, I can have, uh, oh, Alice does and Heidi does. So both of you. So let's start with Alice and go to run to Heidi. There's an annual dinner that people usually report back about. And Heidi? Heidi's still on mute. No, can't hear. No, Heidi, you're still, you're not. I uh, can't hear you. Nope. I can jump in, Jeff. I uh, just let you know when this, the meetings are. There's a meeting in September. Um, it's, I believe, the 28th. It's when our back to school night is. Um, I might double check. It might be the 26th. And then the big program meeting with the dinner uh, is October 24th. Uh, so that's a Thursday night. And then we meet again. Uh, twice in the spring, um, usually around the March time frame. Testing. Oh, was that high? Did we get you through there? Yes. So I think that based on that September date, we're going to have to have the chair appoint this person as well, because there's not enough time, uh, may not be enough time for us to meet again for us to, you know, vote on the candidate that the chair recommends. If that first meeting is in, on September 21st, 4th, there's no guarantee we're going to meet before then. So that would be another thing for you to send your request to Anne Alice. Uh, Dave O'Connor used to really enjoy this particular assignment, just saying that too. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you communicate with a lot of people with jobs in the real world. Yes. A lot of different real worlds, a lot of very interesting different real worlds. So once again, it would be a thing you would submit your name and based to Julia over the next few days, and the chair will probably have to do that appointment as well if we're going to make the September 24th date. Okay, so before I put the motion on the table, are there any questions about any of these committees, subcommittees, did I make any other errors on your requested assignments? Very good. Then um, I would like somebody to make the following motion. To approve all these subcommittees and assignments as written with the change made, that is I took um, Charlene's name off that one committee, plus giving the chair the ability to um, appoint members to the legislative subcommittee and to the general advisory board um liaison so moved second any further discussion of all this work you're going to be doing this year okay roll call vote pam nurse pam nurse acton yes sarah montague arlington yes erica lz bolton yes Steve Ledoux, Concord, yes. Charlie LeBeau, Lancaster, yes. Sharon Musto, Lexington, yes. Jeff Stulen, Needham, yes. Alistair Lucas, Joe, yes. Well, thank you all so much for volunteering to be on these committees and to do that um, extreme amount of work that will be required in this upcoming year. And thanks to my fellow officers who spent a fair amount of time pondering these issues to try to 
arrange things as um, uh, uh, both to what the school committee members requested and for the best of the school committee and the school as a whole. And I look forward to hearing some volunteers for the um, um, legislative committee and for the um, liaison position. So please submit those over the next few days so we can get those positions filled and all the subcommittees you have been recreated. Great. Okay, now, as we mentioned earlier, we're gonna take out of order items 6A and 6B. So Superintendent Driscoll, go to it. Thank you. I'm so glad I uh, had that attempt to talk about a general advisory board to fix my microphone before I had to introduce Cindy. Um, I'd like to welcome Cindy Tamor. She is my new superintendent induction program coach for this year, and I'd like to give you a little background. Um, she was a middle school teacher, science and ELA in Woburn. She was a coordinator for an alternative education program in East Boston a team chair and assistant special education director in Malden, a director of special education and assistant superintendent in Bedford. And finally, she was the superintendent in Melrose until she retired in 2020, but she couldn't stay retired. So she was the interim director of uh, the EDCO Collaborative for two years and an interim special ed director in Bill Ricca for a year. Um, and Cindy would like to um, share some information without, uh, with all of you about the program that I'll be participating in this year. Welcome, Cindy. Thank you, Heidi, um, and thank you for the introduction uh, and my resume. Um, and when I finally stopped being a full-time employee of some kind, I became a NISIP coach. Um, NISIP is the new superintendent's induction program. It is a joint venture from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and the Mass Association of School Superintendents with a funding grant from the Ba, ba Foundation. This is the 15th year. I myself was in the third year. It is a highly valued and successive pro successful program at this point over 300 superintendents in Massachusetts have gone through the program. And the purpose of um, NISIP is to support new superintendents like Heidi as they come to communities that are new to them or they are new to the state and to help them grow and learn so that they can be more successful for your students and families. The program focuses on instructional leadership team building and supervision and evaluation. Um, there is a strong focus on equity across all aspects of education as well. It is a scaffolded program. This year, Heidi will have 48 hours of meetings. That includes six hours a month with me, either directly on site or virtually. Um, in the second year, there'll be 39 hours of meetings. And in the last year, there is a consultancy about four times a year. Um, I will tell you, having gone through the program, I, I just cannot underestimate the value, not only for what um, NISIP has helped new leaders learn and adapt to, but for the network it creates. To this day, I still have a cadre of colleagues that I see and we, are, and we share information among ourselves. Um, to this end, the scaffolded program, Heidi has, uh, as you know, um, which you will report out on tonight, to create an, an uh, entry plan. And this is basically how does she get to know the Minuteman community? Um, it is basically a listening and fact finding. And at the end of that gathering of information, she will report out to you her entry plan findings that will discuss um, the strengths of Minuteman, the challenges Minuteman is facing, and ultimately come next spring, next summer, create a strategy plan. This is not a strategic plan as you may develop, 
where you talk about buildings, grounds, financing. This purely focuses on teaching and learning. And I think, um, Jeff, your mention of the MCAS ballot question is very appropriate considering whatever she finds this year, that will be a large factor that you will have to navigate under her leadership. Um, I'm very happy to answer any questions about the program, but I will tell you, I've already started to work with Heidi. I've been to day two of the leadership retreat. I had a great time. Um, I got to meet the whole team. You really have a great team in place uh, for Minuteman. And I will actually be in the building, what, a week from Friday, Heidi, maybe next week sometime, because while I visited the building, I have yet to have a tour of that magnificent facility you built. And I am really looking forward to that. So if you have any questions, just let me know. School committee members. Could you share those number of hours again? So for the first year, she does 48 hours. So that's six hours a month with me and a full day meeting with her cohort. And then in the second year, it's 39 hours, four hours a month with me, and every other month, a meeting with her cohort. And in the last year, they do regional consultancies, usually three, four superintendents who meet every other month or every third month to share problems of practice. Um, I will tell you, this is all hot. All the, everything that I share with Heidi or Heidi shares with her colleagues is highly confidential. And the purpose really is to support each other in um, becoming better at the job, um, attacking issues that may come up and finding solutions. Well, committee members, now's your chance. You have a lot of expertise here. You can learn some stuff. I just wanted to say I appreciate the background on the program. Thank you, Cindy. Anyone else? Going, ah, Heidi. I would just like to thank Cindy. Um, when we had our superintendent's retreat this summer, um, that's when I met Cindy in person. That was, I think, in July, if I'm not July. mistaken. And Cindy said, I will see you on Monday at Minuteman. She was literally here 9 a.m. the following Monday um, to get started. And, um, and I think we've hit it off and we're a good pair. So um, I'm happy to have this opportunity and I'm happy to share um, the entry plan today. Any other comments or questions? Well then, Cindy, thank you so much for being involved in this program. Thank you for um, sharing a description of it with us, kind of in person, you know, as yeah. a person this today. And um, I think it's time to move on to the superintendent's entry plan, which is item 6B. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so what I shared with you in the backup are the slides for my PowerPoint um, and then the entire entry plan. So I'm going to go over the whole plan and I'd say an executive summary, um, but I won't be reading the entire plan word for word today because it's quite a few pages. So if you'll give me a second to share my screen. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is how I shared this um, with teachers um, and staff on the first day of school. And I know all of you got some information about our welcome back day, um, but I wanted to make sure that the beginnings of the entry plan were in motion. We're hearing voices from all over the district and I'm taking time and not making any snap judgments about um, what Minuteman is or what Minuteman is not um, because there's a very rich history. Um, so at the welcome back with staff and faculty, I reviewed my goals, my entry plan actions, and we recognized service to Minuteman. Um, we did for the first year we had, uh, which I hope will be a new tradition each fall. We recognized uh, teachers, staff members, anyone who works here for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years of service um, 
it was wonderful. I sent the photos if you haven't seen them. Um, and it was a it was a good day. Um, something that we did differently was I used a tool called Mentimeter, and maybe we'll have an opportunity to use that at some point here. So that when I shared um, some of the feedback from the survey in my entry plan, all of the people who were there who may have said, hey, I, it was over the summer, I didn't have time to complete the survey, or I didn't know about the survey, could actually provide live feedback and have a visible reference um, during our actual um, conversation, which I'll give you a sample of um, as we go over this. So the overarching goal of both uh, my goals and the entry plan, which really do overlap, is to renew a sense of community founded in trust, professional professionalism, and transparent communication, which if you received the survey this summer um, or some of the words that we even used then. Um, it's been made very clear to me from all of you when I met with all of you individually that this is absolutely all of our goal um, and um, I'm happy to lead the charge here. So my entry plan has several different steps. So right now we're, we were in the planning and preparation going over to the information and data gathering. So those are kind of overlapping because you'll see I've already started to collect some data. Um, some There's quite a list of key documents that I'm going to review, meetings that I'll attend, uh, people who I'll be meeting with, uh, enrollment's a huge part of that. If you wanna look in detail or you have suggestions for additional things that I may not have listed, please reach out to me individually and I'm happy to check those out. Um, from December to January, that's when I am processing the information, developing um, the framework of a plan, and I will take the next steps from November to January. Those also overlap. So I'm going to read a couple points from that. So when we get to the point where we are at next steps, I will be making a draft of the entry findings and I will be reporting some emerging themes, which I actually have some emerging themes already for you today. Um, and I will have the presentation of the entry findings in February. Um, after that comes the development of a district strategy. And even though it is separate, we do have to make a plan for creating a district strategic plan um, that will start spring and tentatively until the June of 2026. So before I keep going, does anyone have a question for me or for Cindy about the process of the entry plan? Okay. So on the last page of my entry plan, you'll see my goals. My goals do have to relate directly to the entry plan um, because I'm working on it now until midway through the year. I can't start goals in February. So my first goal is effective entry and direction setting. And I will read the top of it. So basically it's a goal is to complete my entry plan, to give you key findings and by May to engage stakeholders in identifying key strategies for the district. Um, the benchmarks, so these are more SMART goals. I know your goals are more general, mine are a little bit more specific, um, that the presentations are completed on schedule and we launch a strategy development. Um, my second goal is to maintain momentum during the transition. So I do need to keep the district moving forward this year by working with leadership on goals, um, make sure that teacher leaders and administrators make meaningful progress on their critical goals. So it is to do my, um, go through the evaluation process with um, each person who reports to me to make sure we're I'm modeling that through um, the district. And the benchmark is completed evaluations, a summative evaluation reports. Those are not public, those don't go out, but that is a part of the process. And my third goal 
is to participate in the new superintendent induction program. Um, I saw Jeff smirking and it seemed like he was laughing a little at the amount of hours, which was a little heartful, Jeff, but that is, uh, I am committed to doing that and working with Cindy. And if you didn't notice, I also added an additional layer. Um, I'm meeting with the president of MAVA um, to discuss and share some ideas about MAVA creating a companion program to NISAP that addresses the specific needs of voca new vocational superintendents. And I think that it is very important that, I, I think Cindy, am I the only vocational superintendent that who's new this year? Yes, you are. Um, we've had some schools that have large voc programs, but no, not, no one that is a regional voc like you. With that, with that, a committee like you have represents <laughs> ten districts. <laughs> right, it's very di it's it's very different. Um, yeah. So right now, I'm in a, a, a I'm in a cohort of one. Um, so um, there's another superintendent of, at another school district who uh, at a vocational school district who has taken me under her wing. She's been absolutely wonderful, and I'm hoping that the two of us, along with the leadership of Mava can come up with some sort of a structure so that in the future, um, it will be an option to work with NISIP in this way and it will be a wonderful add-on. Um, so that will absolutely take um, quite some additional time as well. Um, so if you look at those details, those are my three goals. And I did wanna share with you some of the work that I've been doing already with some of my entry findings. You saw, excuse me, my the entry plan. Um, the survey takes me on the way um, to those findings. I know that you've all seen that joint survey that was sent out. Um, and this was the question that was asked to students and teachers and parents and anyone who had the link who cared to give us some opinions about Minuteman. In your opinion, what practices should Minuteman sustain, revise, or reconsider to positively move forward for the success of all students? Um, something very interesting is the average response time was seven minutes. That, so that means people really were thoughtful about what they shared. I was very impressed with that. Um, this is some information that I also shared with the staff. This isn't new today. Um, we had 44 responses, which seems not, doesn't seem like a ton, but it's about 5%. So for a summer survey, that's not so bad. But as we were reviewing the statements, um, because there were only 44 and they were very unique, the most common words that came up were, thank goodness, uh, this was done with AI, not with me and a calculator, by the way, um, students, school, classes, work, CTE students, Minuteman students, Minuteman, and need. I thought that was a very positive outcome for the most common words. And this is what we did as an activity. Um, I shared uh, a sample of quotes from the survey, some from students, some from um, one student actually asked if they could have clemency on overdue library books, very hilarious. Um, but there were lots of statements and I needed the staff to tell me, do we agree with this? Which is the thumbs up. Do we love this? or do we disagree with this and it's, or it's untrue? So I know that looks very tiny, but this was one of my favorite statements, rebuilding trust and communication at all levels will go far. Thank you, that was from an anonymous educator or staff member. I had 45 thumbs up, I had 35 loves and I had one thumbs down. So why this is wonderful to share is because everybody saw those numbers in real time. So if, Somebody says, hey, we don't want that. That's, it's just not true. We shared it um, with everybody in real time. And I thought that was really important to do because people want to give their opinions. They want to be heard. And if I'm starting to do this process, I really need to give many different types of opportunities for people to share um, what they think Minuteman needs. And if I'm not mistaken, I actually used Mentimeter at the, Cindy, did I do that on your day or not? I used Mentimeter at the retreat too. I wanted to test it out with administrators. We it was, it um, 
The second day we did some of that. Oh, okay. Yes. Was, yeah. Yeah. So it was very useful and, um, and that's it. And my last slide is something that I shared with the faculty. And this is my personal philosophy. Leadership is not a license to do less. It's a responsibility to do more. And that is what I'm committed to do. And I would love to um, hear any of your questions or comments. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about the full detailed um, entry plan or anything I just shared. I just have uh, two quick comments I'm going to make. Uh, the first one is, yes, I am amused by the amount of hours you're going to be spending <laughs> on this. I think it's for the important for the school committee members to really reflect on how many hours you're going to be spending on this program, how extensive and important it is. The second one is that if you look in your packet, you'll see um, a little further after her presentation is the list the, of her three goals, her three suggested goals for the year. Um, and some information on how she's going to achieve those goals or report on those goals. That's very important because, because what we have to do is we have to accept those goals at our next meeting. And that's what she's going to be evaluated on at the end of the year. So she mentioned her goals in descriptive form in her presentation. They're in written form in your packet, very nicely laid out, goal one, goal two, goal three. This is what I'm going to do for it in some detail. And we will want to vote on those at our next meeting and she'll be evaluated on it later in the year. That's how this stuff works usually. Is that your understanding, Heidi? Yes. So um, those are all of my comments, Alice. I think it's very difficult to be a leader, especially these days. And um, I'm glad that the superintendents have a program to support educational leaders. Um, and I'm excited that it's going to expand with um, I have a focus too, to, you know, just, a, uh, I don't know what the word would be, but to include the diversity of the educational experience in the vocational sector is very, very different. And I'm just very grateful to everybody who's helping to support superintendents. Other comments or questions for Heidi on her presentation or? Yeah. Erica. Yes, hi, Heidi. Um, thanks for the presentation. I was curious, um, you did mention that you were in the data collection phase, um, <clears throat> gathering information. Um, I don't know if you could share like what type of data you're collecting or looking at, um, whether yeah. it's something. I absolutely can. So yeah. there's a complete list of the key documents and data that I'll be looking at um, in your backup in the full plan, but I can read you some of those. So okay. I'll be doing some short survey opportunities, individual and group conversations with stakeholders, informal visits to academic, vocational classrooms, supplemental programming, and general school operations, um, a review of key documents and data, school improvement plan, district strategic plan, school um, report cards, school discipline reports, MCAS, AP, ACT, SAT, um, the NEASC reports, tiered focus monitoring reports, our collective bargaining agreement, the policy manual, crisis action plans, administrator job descriptions, curriculum guides, school handbook, faculty handbook, um, senior exit interviews, certifications, CTE advisory board minutes and programmatic reviews, MTI handbook, the district curriculum accommodation plan, the district enrollment data, both nine through 12 and MTI. So it's pretty comprehensive what we did to make sure that anything that existed that I should read um, gets on here is I actually meet with um, uh, the president and vice president of the union um, pretty regularly. I think it's been about once a week. So they actually saw some of this and gave me input into things they thought I should look at, as well as all of the administrators. I brought a full draft of this plan to the retreat so that every administrator um, would review it and give me feedback. And I don't wanna put anybody on the spot, but we do have a couple administrators who were present. 
Paul was there. Um, Katie was there. Um, if you have questions for them about that process, um, they could give a perspective that isn't from the person who ran the review. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions on the report that we have just seen? Very good. Thank you so much for your report, Superintendent. And thank you again, Cindy, for being part of this process and for joining us today. Appreciate it. Now we uh, bounce back to item 5F. Oh, uh, before we get to 5F, I'd just like a comment from the subcommittee. Because of the length of the packet and some of the things in there might have been a surprise, like the auditor's report that might have been, what am I getting this for? I wrote you a little memo just kind of you know, describing why it is you have so much stuff in there. And I'd like to know if that was, uh, I don't, I'm not going to do that very often uh, because usually we don't have packets that are quite this complicated. But was that useful or was that just a waste of your time to read? So I'll know for the future, useful. Okay. Very useful. Okay, so if I have another really, uh, an item, a complicated item in the packet that you're going to say, what the heck is that, then I will do something similar and say, that's why it's in the packet. Okay, great. Right. So let me tell you why uh, item 5F is on your agenda. So as you know, we are a member of the um, MASC, Mass Association of School Committees, an organization we've been involved with for many, many years and has done, I think, many, many very positive things in the state. I, it was brought to my attention that in a very unusual move, MASC has taken a stand on a very controversial, on both sides, uh, ballot question that is coming up in the November election. It's the question that, a question that will impact us enormously, which is, do we eliminate the MCAS exam? Now, normally what MASC does is they, you know, poll the members or we get together one of their conferences and we discuss these issues and we come up with a resolution based on that discussion. But because of the timing of the election being before that meeting is going to occur, they got their board of directors together and they voted on a opinion on ballot question two, which was to accept it and to reject the idea of having the MCAS. So that brings us two issues. The first issue is that I find it unbelievably annoying that they would take a stand on a uh, important issue like this without um, membership input. Um, it, it may be technically within their um, bounds but I find it extremely distasteful. The other thing that caught my attention is that um, not everybody's opinion is that the MCAS should be eliminated. Without going into any detail, from the very beginning of the MCAS, one of the questions I've asked at Minuteman as a school committee member, to whoever was making the annual or the twice a year presentation of the MCAS was, is the MCAS a good thing or a bad thing overall for Minuteman? And the answer that I normally got, that I always got, was it's a good thing for Minuteman. It has had us improve our academics, improve our curriculum. I believe that that's what led to the program by which in their freshman year, they get a full year of math and English. I think that was for the MCAS. So clearly, at the, at the very least, there's going to be two sides to this story here at MCAS about MCAS. So what I am going to at some point suggest is, and you're going to hear from the superintendent and then anybody can make whatever you know comments they want to about this. I'm not going to suggest that we take a actual vote on this issue. You know, we approve, disapprove item two. What I am going to do though is suggest that we um, um, send a letter to MASC expressing our displeasure of them taking a stand on it and perhaps listing some reasons why people may not be um, in favor of question two, but not to take a vote on it. 
So I'm going to uh, kind of uh, open this by um, asking the superintendent if she has uh, an opinion on this issue and or just whatever comments she has for it. So. Um, sure. Um, thank you. Um, I would like to direct you to your packet. There is um, from Tufts University, there's the state policy analysis where um, the topic is question two, eliminating the MCAS graduation requirement. I wanna make sure that we understand because I'm not sure with all of the social media out there that is blasting us that people understand, and Jeff, I would never interrupt you, but we are the vote is not to eliminate MCAS. The vote is actually to eliminate MCAS as a graduation requirement. So some of the things that aren't our favorites at schools, the amount of days it takes, the time, um, those things would still actually happen. We still, the state would still be using this data to look at the achievement of schools. Um, so that troubles me a bit because it, it isn't clear, I think, everywhere that it is just the graduation requirement itself that would be lifted. Um, and that's a big, huge difference. Um, so that being said, I would really love for more people to read the balanced info. Um, when I started my career, I was a teacher um, before MCAS. There should be an acronym for that, B MCAS or something. Um, and I taught seniors at an urban district. And it would break my heart um, that there were some very capable students who didn't have the opportunity or to have access to rigorous curriculum. And I was at a comprehensive, I was teaching at a comprehensive school district. Um, and it was a crazy time. Um, some of you remember, I'm sure I know some people in here were teaching then, or you, you know, it was huge. And when urban schools, especially our scores were abysmal, there were all sorts of actions taken to change things. Like Jeff said, some kids didn't have particular subjects full year. So we would give half of algebra one and then wonder why they can't do algebra two, those kinds of things. Um, it really made some changes with structures of schools. Um, and then when it became a graduation requirement, the scores skyrocketed. And many people talked about, oh, that's because we changed things. That's now, yes, things were changed, but that very first year when everything jumped up, you cannot make systemic change in a year to make jumps like we saw. I think it was 2004, so long ago. Um, but that jump was because the stakes changed. So our problem will be if we are being judged by this test still, even if this vote goes through, but it doesn't count for anything, um, I fear that school districts will be judged on performances that don't really represent what their kids do and the public perception and all of those other things. Now, that being said, um, do I think school districts know who should graduate and have the right? Yes, absolutely. And I know at Minuteman, people, when I've asked them about their feelings about this, um, they say, well, it doesn't affect us. Our kids just do what they have to do. The most it affected us is when we made changes that people really like, like the English structure at Minuteman, for example. Um, that even came through in the survey. Please keep it, the English how it is. Um, so that's, that's, I guess in short, it's such a huge, heavy issue that will really change so much no matter how this goes. And I think we have a wonderful, well-balanced group here. And I think we'll be ready to handle it, um, whatever it happens to be. You're right. It was not eliminating the MCAS, but eliminating it as a useful measurement of what schools are doing. Because a student, when you, if you were to, if I was to give a student a math test and say, this test isn't going to count for your grade, uh, I don't think that I'd get much effort in, in studying or preparing for the test. So the same thing, yes, they will still be giving the MCAS, at least for a while, 
but the information we get from it will be worse. And I'm just going to give, um, before I go to the membership, I'm just going to give you my kind of, uh, I have 10 points here, but I'm not going to go through them about what, why it would be problematic. But the worst one, I know this because if you only know this, if you really work at a school for a very long time, what's going to happen is right now we have about 1% of students who fail the MCAS, something like that. The thing that's that it's not good that there's anybody not passing the MCAS, but the thing that is good is that you know who's not passing it and you know where they're weak. If there isn't a universal standardized test and all districts are going to try to create their own standard, most districts are going to create a standard in which the measurement of the students who are doing poorly is going to be extremely bad. And you're going to have a much higher group of students who will be learning little because it's not going to be measured properly. And they won't know it until after they graduate and they get to whatever that goes next, college or whatever. So for 1% who you know what the, what the problem might be to 5 or 10 or 15 or whatever percentage who's going to have a, uh, a weaker education and they won't even know it. Uh, because what happens is, is when districts want to look better, they kind of fudge they fudge the standards and they fudge how they grade the standards. And if you want examples of how that happened in Newton South, which I'm not going to give you unless you ask for it, I have numerous examples of how they, um, were, in my opinion, fudge things to make the statistics look better for the way they wanted it to do and in ways that did not help kids. That's at Newton South. And that's what's going to run rampant through, through most of the districts of the state. Some will do a better job. Minuteman would do a better job because of the type of school it is and the type of people we have here. Many others, especially the ones who are the worst off financially, are going to not do such a good job in creating their own unique standard. So um, comments or questions from anybody here, um, Sharon? So um, I think... I think it's really important for us to remember that um, although it may quote unquote only be the 1%, I think a lot of students who have learning disabilities or learning differences have a real hard time with the MCAS. And I'm um, in my 30 plus years and being at, in special ed, I've seen a lot of kids not pass the MCAS that I know have those skills. Um, and I think um, you know, when you talked about you've seen schools like fudge the scores and stuff, I've seen MCAS scores um, have that situation for districts where they've I've seen students getting accommodations that they have no business having because the district needed it to be. Um, you know, we need we need good scores because we need our district to look good because we want people to move here and things like that. So I think I think what I take out of that. Um, of all the documentation of, you know, question two, pro and, and con, is just the idea that it's looking to acknowledge that students do learn differently. And there are other ways other than just a standardized test that, in my opinion, from administering more versions of the MCAS than I care to remember, um, I'm not sure that the results show me what those students, like where their weak parts are because I've only administered it to special ed students, not to um, non-special ed students. But I just think that the idea is that, you know, we would still have it, we would still take it. And I understand, you know, you're saying when a student thinks it doesn't count, but I can also tell you that pretty much third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, they realize that it doesn't really count because it only counts in 10th grade when you have to do it to graduate. And that's when they take a lot of the language out of the test so that students can pass it more easily. So I just think we spend a lot of time teaching to those tests and we spend a lot of time, I think it would be more benefit, in my opinion, I think it's more beneficial for us to look at the whole child and maybe be like how you do on MCAS and how you do in your classes, because I don't think that it should be all, all for one. But I think a lot of our students at Minuteman, although they do pass it and those teachers are amazing in making our students be ready to take the test, I do think we have to look at the emotional impact that the test has on students who've worked really hard 
throughout all their years of high school and then just struggle on that test and then feel badly about themselves. So. I, I wrote down a couple of your points. I, I absolutely agree with you that this is definitely something that doesn't count previously. If you notice statistically, what year do those scores drop? Middle schools. Middle schools get a bad rap because those kids are old enough to know it doesn't count. High schools, there's a miraculous jump with most students. Elementary school is a different animal. And I've looked at these K-12. Um, what you said really resonates with me. I hope that there is not a single educator out there or school district out there that does not look at the whole child. Because right now, all school districts have class requirements for graduation. It is, in fact, all of those things right now. Just like you said, it's MCAS, it's attending the school, it's passing your classes, it's getting enough credits. It's that piece. And if kids need extra support, that is absolutely, absolutely what school districts should do. And if school districts are doing the right thing, which I do believe Minuteman does the right thing, they make sure that students who don't pass that initial test, you're not saying, here's what you can't do, here's what you need to do. They're looking at it and saying, okay, when you get to that retest, which is a much easier test because it's not an achievement test, we're going to make sure you have the right classes, we're going to make sure you have the right supports and prepare for an MCAS appeal. For science, you only have to take it once. For English and math, you take it three times. And those, those work. Um, and I'm curious if there are students who didn't get a diploma, I am curious if those school districts filed an appeal. Did they have the kids take the right classes? I hope that they're using all of those tools because this should not be a scary situation. It shouldn't be. Um, so I, I the, the perception, I think that you only need MCAS to graduate. We have to make sure people understand it still exists. So when you're saying, oh, people want to fudge scores or people want scores to look a certain way because they're being judged, we will still be judged because the vote isn't to get rid of it. Um, it's so, it is It is really a catch-22. Um, and I hope, um, I, I really feel we're in good shape at Minuteman either way, but it, it's it's a big deal. I hope that addressed or added, added and didn't, wasn't repetitive. Alice. Um, <clears throat> my central issue with this is procedural. Um, I believe their board took the vote in June. They did not poll the membership. They have access to all of us via their email. They could have sent out a survey. They have in their bylaws a mechanism for sending out surveys. Um, they didn't do that. And they are supposed to represent us. They're supposed to be a collaborative organization that represents school districts and does things to benefit education. But this is a very big deal. There are implications potentially for funding formulas. There are all kinds of things that might come up as a result of this decision. And there is no plan for day two. That is the thing that bothers me. If you look at what it is, they're saying, you know, take away this requirement for graduation and then whatever, that's why we have this feeling of a chaotic system that we're going to face. We don't know what. We should move our strategic uh, meeting because we don't know what's going to happen is not educational policy planning in its finest. And, <clears throat> you know, that is um, my personal beef with M with MASC at the moment is, is that they chose to do this without any input, without any discussion and it isn't as if they didn't know about it in advance if they voted in June. It came up to me in an email in September on the day after Labor Day. So that is too too much of a shock. There's no day two, not even day two plan in what they're doing there. It just says, you know, eliminate that as a requirement. And then every every one of these districts would have to come up with their own solution. And many of us remember what it was like before when a kid failed 
algebra one, and then they failed it again, and they never took geometry, and then they had to take the MCAS test the first time, and then everybody learned, oh, you know, the reason why they failed is because they never took geometry. It was a real wake-up call. So I, I think Jeff's suggestion of sending a letter to the MASC board and saying, you know, this is not a good process um, for dealing with something of this importance. And, you know, here are some thoughts for you to consider is a good one. Charlene. I sort of now want to second well, both what Alice said and Sharon said. Um, with regard to Sharon's comments, um, I, I think that the 700 students that don't pass is still significant um, because those are the students who need a high school diploma because they're not probably going to go to college. Um, and I also want to remind the, the committee that one of our own parents at Minuteman was a strong proponent of this legislation, and we need to consider that as well. Um, secondly, with regard to what Alice said, um, having gone to the MASC uh, conference last year, there was, and it was my first year in attendance, um, there was a lot of discussion about how MASC represents us, MASC works for us, and I was really shocked to see that there was um, a decision made without any consideration of the membership. That's it. Here's a, a one more one more thought. When I um, started over at Minuteman, there the the uh, there's been a transition. I actually it started before I started at Minuteman. It started like thirty years ago. Transition between before what people used to think about vocational schools and the way they think about it now. So the transition has been uh, basically uh, scorn. You really don't, if your kid goes there, it says something really bad about you, your kid, and your family, to admiration. And part of that has been because of the MCAS. It's been the M, part of the MCAS because they can look at our MCAS scores and say, despite having 40% special education, look how well you've done on a universal test. Not a test that you just made up to look good, but a test that we all have to take. We know how hard it is. And that has been one of the reasons for the, in my view, because I've talked to people, of uh, the shift of people's perception of career technical schools. And, and, and perhaps one of the reasons why we were able to get enough support to have this building in place, because we um, kind of eliminated the idea that the education we get here is inferior. And that's what the MCAS did, it did for us as far as public perception goes. Other comments or questions on, uh, there's been no um, motion yet, but I've kind of told you what the motion will be one way or the other. Sharon. I guess I just want to clarify, like I 100% agree with you and Alice that MASC never should have, well, it, it feels wrong that they took a stance without polling the membership. I just think that it would, be important for us to make that our point if we are going to write a letter to them and not in any way say that we think that their stance is right or wrong. I think we should just state that they shouldn't have made a stance without polling us because I don't think that we as a committee can really, I don't, I'm not sure that we have consensus of whether we think it should be yay or nay. And I just think that we should be careful about not also, or also not making a decision, um, I don't know. I just think we should just be clear on that. It's just, we think that they were wrong in their process, but not necessarily that they are right or wrong in their choice. Some, com, com, uh, some uh, I find this very distasteful, but some communities have are taking a vote. Their school committee is taking a vote pro or con of this issue, which I find personally unsatisfactory as well. Um, yeah, Pam. I just want to say I, I completely agree with Sharon. I think we absolutely should write a letter. I know I personally um, have can and have argued both sides of this um, issue. Um, I think, you know, and, and I think some of, you know, those arguments have already been articulated, so I won't do it again. But, you know, particularly this is, uh, you know, when you're talking about students with disabilities, 
it has a major impact on both sides. And so I would not be looking to take a position, but definitely be looking um, to talk about the procedural problems with um, um, MASC uh, putting out that this position. Well, then I would like uh, somebody to make the motion that the legislative subcommittee uh, draft a letter to the MASC, MCA, uh, right, MC, MCAS, uh, expressing our opinion on their procedure for coming out with their statement. So moved. Do I have a second before we take comments? Second. Second. Okay, Alice. I think um, <clears throat> we should give direction to the legislative subcommittee. Um, I think that uh, it's, it's my opinion that, um, well, that they're by they're not asking us what they've done is they've actually not allowed us to take the temperature of our own community um, and to have the thorough discussions that are required in order to understand this problem and to think about what would happen on day two. Day two for Minuteman, I mean, we can ask the superintendent, you know, what would be the implications? I don't know if there, there's time in the day given, you know, all the things that are going on, but to to briefly say what kinds of what kinds of changes would have to happen in a single school district or vocational school districts in general um, to address, you know, the potential change of not having the state level um, requirement for graduation, which is what that is. But I, I think we should we should ask the legislative subcommittee also to include that, that they, they did not give us the heads up to take the temperature of our own communities um, and to have the, the, the high level discussion about the issues so that we thoroughly all understand them. We're reading this information in the packet, which is excellent. Um, it's a very complicated program. It's something that went on for decades. Um, they, they've been through all these arguments before uh, with regard to kids having with disabilities and so on. And, um, you know, I don't think they, they took it lightly back then. Um, so, and I, and I don't think that people who are in favor of the MCAS are, you know, not in favor of kids with disabilities. I think it's uh, much more complicated than that. I, um, I do think that Minuteman, regardless of how this comes out, is, is poised to support its students. And I think that what may happen <laughs> is school committees would then have to decide is there a policy change necessary? Because I think it is in everyone's graduation policy at this point, because it's state regulation. What does that policy change look like? So that would then put the onus on school committees. So an appeal process, uh, that would be the next, kind of like maybe what happened with masks that got pushed to school committees. Um, and that I think would be the next step. It's going to be very challenging, both for school committees, for administrations, and for teachers, all of whom would have to create new um, uh, standards for graduation. Furthermore, the legislation would say, okay, we, we can't have MCAS as a graduation requirement anymore. What other restrictions should we put on school systems like they do in other states, which is, for example, to determine the courses that are needed for graduation? So they're going to make well, they're going to be other changes that are uh, that are going to come down the pike that are going to be extremely expensive and extremely time consuming, possibly without any um, great benefit. We've seen this sort of thing happen before. As a teacher, I've been on the blunt end of a lot of this stuff. Um, so anyway, right, there is a uh, a motion on the table. There is a comment from Alice. Other comments on the motion on the table. Very well then, bring it to a vote. Pam. Pam Nursacton, yes. Sarah Montague Arlington, yes. Erica Ozzie Bolton, yes. Steve will do Concord, yes. 
Alan Gabriel Lancaster, yes. Unmuted now, Sharon Musto, Lexington, yes. Jeff Stolenian, yes. House Lucas Joe, yes. Okay, now legislative subcommittee. So I'm hoping that you're going to send information to Julia. Uh, if you want to be on this subcommittee, which is going to be doing a lot of other things together with the administration. Now, I would like, to, uh, in order for this to be timely enough, here's the bad news. I would like this letter to be uh, drafted within a week or two. And I may want us to have a special meeting so we can look at it, revise it, and approve the letter so it'll go out in a relatively timely fashion. And without going into any details, there may be another issue that we need a special meeting for so we can put the, the two together in about two weeks. Um, so that is what I'm going to ask for. I'm going to ask if you want to be on the subcommittee, um, let me know, you know tomorrow. And also, if you want to be the liaison, let me know over the next few days so we can, the chair will appoint some people to it and we can uh, get this in the works and get it out. And again, the goal is to object to the process. Uh, we're not going to take a vote on this as a school committee, yay or nay, like some of the committees are doing, which again, I feel very objectionable personally. Any other final comments before we move on? So thank you for expressing your opinion on this on this very difficult subject and coming together to work at a group despite a diversity of opinions on it. Um, if our if our federal government worked in a similar manner, we would be a in much better shape in this country. They could learn a lot from us, not vice versa. Okay. And I got to find my agenda again. Moving on, I think that the long suffering principal finally gets to have his say. So, Mr. Principal, do you have a report for us? Yes, I do. And I'm um, going to share my screen. And I'm sure I hope everyone can see that. Um, so wanted to give an overview regarding the first few weeks of school, um, giving from we are officially in the third week of school and we've had two weeks under our belt where we've had uh, students do rotations through their academics and their CTE classes and just a general feel around the building and things that happen so the school committee is aware of what what's been going on. So to start off, this works. I'm stuck. Try this. Ah, there we go. Um, Mr. Tilsley, Tilsley and myself, we um, held class meetings, student meetings for each grade level, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. Uh, we reviewed expectations. I wanted the students, obviously, to get to know me, not just to say, who's this guy in the office? Because um, I'm new there, and they really haven't had an opportunity to fully uh, interact with me. So when they're seeing me around the building, they know exactly who I am and what my goal is uh, for Minuteman and for them uh, to be their highest potentials as learners. During that time as well, we had um, uh, guidance counselors come down just to review a couple of things. We had our student advisors, our class advisors to talk about events as well. Um, and I would say that the feel for everyone was that it was very exciting. Uh, it was really exciting for um, them to really get started within the school year. I was very impressed how, you know, our our um, our sophomores and our seniors went right to their CTE classes while everybody else was heading to their academics. And it was like a, almost like a well-oiled machine that I didn't have to do much or, to kind of change or fix or anything like that. So that was very impressive. Then after the, uh, the student meetings, um, Within second week, um, our director of uh, CTE programming, uh, Ms. Bouchard, she um, made sure that our freshmen were aware of their uh, exploratory rotations that we had going on. Um, we had our staff that were meeting in the student union, and we have also the, our students 
our upperclassmen that were also helping out, making sure that our freshmen knew where they were heading for their programs. And just like to give a couple of shout outs to the people in these pictures. So if you look over to the early education, we have uh, Tanya uh, Sylvester from Lancaster, Liberty Mikulski from Acton. Um, we had Matilda Trudell from Arlington, uh, Sequoia Kamini from Arlington, Karina Kajerni from Needham, and Gabriel Kajami from Lexington. They were a big help. And then for our horticulture and plant science, we had um, Vala Presbo from Lexington and Eleanor Paul from Acton. So uh, really and truly, this is what I see is that makes Miniman special is that, you know, there's nobody that's really lagging behind everybody supporting each other and doing the best that they can to uh, make sure that the day is running smoothly and students know where to go. Um, I know Ms. Cabral mentioned it, and I will say that athletics has been a big, big, big factor uh, moving forward. Um, this picture here, I'll just give a quick overview. Uh, the soccer team, um, prior to the season starting, has a uh, scrimmage practice with Keith Tech. Uh, they come over here and they work on skills together. So it's kind of a nice collaboration between two regional school districts. But um, very excited if most people might realize or don't realize that uh, our fall athletes actually start two weeks prior to school even starting. Um, you know, they do their preseason workouts uh, that are there. And just a reminder for our fall athletics, you know, our cheerleading team is, has been practicing. We have our cross country team for the boys and girls varsity our football team. We have the JV and varsity team golf, um, soccer, boys and girls, both on varsity uh, volleyball, which is uh, really taken stride from what I've heard and what I've researched out. Volleyball's really become a sport that has really increased through Minuteman. And um, I'd be remiss not to mention that uh, a huge help has been our trainer, Mr. Jesse Williams as well. Um, really and truly, he's making sure everybody's able and actively able to continue. Um, we do know that things happen, but um, it's important that that trainer is available and He's been great. I watched him literally when I was looking at, uh, I was watching the girls game and the boys game just uh, last week. And I watched him bounce between both fields. Um, it really was a good uh, good feeling to see that somebody was on top of all of that. So um, just again, great things that are happening at Miniman and that's only in week two. Uh, the final thing that we've sort of implemented here at Miniman is uh, the voices of Minuteman High School. Um, I've had students that have auditioned, auditioned for uh, this role where they're doing the announcements in the morning. And the point of this too is that on Fridays, um, well, they'll be pre-recorded on Thursdays, but on Fridays, um, they'll be pre-recording the announcements and we'll be doing the video announcements on Fridays. Probably call it the Minuteman Minute. Uh, we're, we're working on a catch a catchphrase uh, for that. But um, these are our three seniors that auditioned and have accepted the position and they've been doing such a great job. Um, I think it really makes a great feel for the school too. So I just wanna give a shout out to um, Felix Nelson there on the right. And then we have, uh, he's from Arlington. We have Sarah Selsa from Acton and Emily Grandin from Medford. So all these students um, on a rotating basis because some go to co-op, um, some have uh, um, field trips, things like that, that they've been doing. So we've been working on a rotating schedule and we may need to actually put this a little bit towards the juniors as well. Um, so we're working on that just to make sure that we have a voice uh, every day when the announcements are being mentioned. But it's a very exciting time uh, for Minuteman and it was a great, uh, the energy it was a great first two weeks and the third week. I mean, it's just been wonderful to be part of the, all the positivity that's been going on at Minuteman. So just want to make sure I gave the school committee that update and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions, questions. Charlene. Just a quick question about the voices of Minuteman. Yeah. Like, it's only open to juniors and seniors? As of right now, um, but I obviously would be, wouldn't be remiss to not open it up to everybody. Um, 
I think we're just working it slow and then seeing what we can build in. Other questions, comments? My comment is thank you very much for those great pictures. I loved them. Thank you. Uh, gave you a good, good view of what's going on. Any other questions or comments for your new principal? No, I just want to add that I, I love the fact that students are doing the morning announcements. I think that's a great way to build a nice culture and community. Thank you. Anything else? Very good. We move on to a, I, I normally don't say this, but a very exciting finance report. All right. Um, uh, first of all, I'm really happy to announce that the MSBA has approved our final payment. We've received the final payment and our ban has been paid off. So I know I feel like we should have a party. You know, I remember when I was a kid, when my parents paid off the mortgage, they had a mortgage burning party. So I feel like we should have like a ban burning party or something like that but and, and if you don't if you don't mention steve i noticed that fort spalding is here and unusual yeah. move forward would you like to make a comment on the completion of the project if you're still there maybe you went to get a coke or something um the only comment i'll have yeah i i was hoping it would be live so we could go into the msba and then some of us would go off to some establishment afterwards but they did yeah. it by zoom so i left and left the state and went somewhere else instead. Um, but I, I I looked at when the school committee had a school building committee, and it's very interesting. It was, I think it's September of 2011. And that school building committee has been in force up until right now. And it was the same people pretty much the whole time. I think we, we, um, one person didn't participate much, so I won't count him. And another person did drop out for other reasons, uh, although he stayed close to Minuteman. So it's pretty exceptional that you can have people serve on a committee for that many years, and, and they did a great job. So I have nothing but great things to say about the committee. Um, I would had the fortune last week of going out and being with some people from Skanska, who are our owner's project manager, and they still say that the Minuteman job has been their favorite. And when I think of that, they've done Ar uh, um, Attleboro, they've done Waltham, they've done Lowell, that th th Skanska has. And, you know, they still think of Minuteman as their favorite. It, it's really quite something. So I think we have a lot to be proud of. I think we have a great building. My only warning is you got to keep it up and you're going to have to spend money to keep it up on a regular basis. But you know, it was a good project, and um, I actually talked to Dr. Bequillen uh, yesterday and today about another subject, and he feels the same way. So it's good. Thank you, Court. Sorry for the interruption, Steve, but I thought oh, it, it, it's that's great. I mean, you know, anybody uh, should feel really happy as you be forward. And and if memory serves me, I think we were expecting this final approval about a year ago, maybe last October. So it's it's been a long time coming. You have a good memory, but the MSBA on closeouts is not a quick process. Right, right, right. I know Kevin thought we'd get it about a year ago, but it just didn't work out for whatever reason. Um, uh, the Finance Committee did meet on August 19th and September 3rd. Uh, we did review a, a, a draft uh, of policy DJE, which is um, uh, regarding procurement and bidding. Um, MASC has, has made some recommendations that basically would bring the policy up to date with uh, changes in state law. Um, and uh, we just had one little concern that, uh, that Nikki has been able to resolve for us. So uh, that will be getting forward to your committee, Alice, for review at some point. And um, I guess with that, uh, Nikki, let's uh, turn it over to Markham and, and, the, uh, and the Student Activity Fund audit. Hi, everyone. Um, unfortunately, the auditors had a conflict tonight. So I, um, Steve, if you're comfortable, I'll provide a quick update on the one page um, response. The okay. auditors did come to a finance committee meeting and present. Um, and certainly if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, so I will share my screen. This is included in your packet. Um, Markram, 
are our auditors and they provided some agreed upon procedures. Our student activity accounts, which is the student um, fundraise money, um, are um, accounts that we present to you quarterly. Um, so every three years they're required um, by the state to be audited by our auditors. Um, this was a few of the findings that they had in regards to some of the transactions that they tested. Um, one of the findings was a um, a cash um, a cash deposit that didn't have pre-numbered receipts. Since then, the horticulture program has um, gotten an iPad, and they will have um, pre-numbered receipts for all transactions going forward. Um, the other compliance finding they had was um, based upon a deposit not having a student advisor sign off. Um, the business office did receive the funds, and in transparency, we provide updates to the advisors um, on a quarterly basis. They were aware of this, but the signature was not on the form. So those were two small compliance findings. The business office is aware of them um, and will ensure that you know going forward, those two um, items are met. I reviewed the inactive accounts with our principal. This morning, we're gonna reach out to the advisors. Um, what the auditors do is look at um, any accounts that haven't had revenue or um, expenses within the last three years to determine if they're still active accounts. And the last um, kind of recommendation they had was implementing a statement of final accountability for any student travel. So we did have stu two student travel disbursements that were tested. Um, those were um, travel like a gas receipt for um, one of our student vans. Um, they are recommending that any student travel, even if it's just a gas receipt, has a statement of accountability, which is a summary of all the um, receipts for the travel that happened. So we will be implementing that as well. Um, we are going to have Markham audit our student activity account again next year, and we'll provide you with an update. And that is about it for the summary. We also provided the actual report from Markham. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has them. And as, as Nikki, Nikki pointed out, the uh, the finance subcommittee did have this presentation by Markham, and and uh, you know we were happy with uh, with uh, Nikki and her staff's uh, response to the audit. Very good. Okay, uh, I guess we're moving on, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, in your packet, last but not least, is our budget process calendar for FY26. I, it hurts me to say that number. I, I just can't believe it. But at any rate, um, we are now starting budget season. So uh, we have put a calendar in there for your review. Some of the some of the key dates, I think, as they relate at least to the school committee, the uh, uh, the admin team and the staff will be obviously compiling budgets through uh, uh, the better part of this fall. Um, but uh, come early November, we uh, the finance subcommittee will have a, uh, a presentation of initial drafts, which basically would be the departmental requests uh, uh, to our finance subcommittee. Uh, uh, then the uh, superintendent and her team will be reviewing things and Come December, uh, uh, December 2nd, uh, Finance Subcommittee will have our first uh, budget overview uh, review. December 16th, the second, in between and December 10th, uh, we'll give a little presentation of where we're at with the budget to the full school, school committee. And then uh, come January, we'll be developing our preliminary estimate to our members, member towns, and then getting geared up for our uh, budget public hearing, which is scheduled for January 30th with a snow date of February 4th. So it's, once again, it'll be a busy fall and early winter for us. If anybody has any questions. You know, the year is really starting when you get your budget calendar. I'm yeah. sure that Heidi was extremely happy when this crossed her desk for the first time. 
I always, I always viewed it as like the first pitch of baseball season when, when this thing came out. Any questions or comments on the budget calendar? So that affects the science finance subcommittee a lot and the school committee, not for a while, but still. Uh, very good. Does that conclude your report? Uh, it does, Mr. Chair. Very good. So that concludes the business for our regular meeting, but we do have the fun of an executive session coming up. And the good news is that uh, Julia has sent you a separate link for the executive session. So when we finish this session, we'll close out this link. Go to your next one and, you know, for the miracle of Zoom, hopefully we'll be back together. So I'm going to read the purpose of the executive session as is required by Massachusetts law. Uh, and this is going to be, I believe that we're going to need um, um, the full school committee and uh, Julia and Heidi to join us not to return to open session. Is that correct? We need Julia and Heidi and no one else. Right. Pursuant to MGL chapter 30A section 21, 20A3 to discuss strategy with respect to likely litigation with the town of Lincoln regarding permit fees if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares. Once again, uh, Julia and Heidi will be joining us, not to return to open session. Somebody like to make that motion, please. So moved. Second. Very good. Roll call vote. Pam. <laughs> Governor Sackton, yes. Sarah Montague, Arlington, yes. Erica. Sorry. Erica L. Z. Bolton, yes. Steve Ledoux, Concord, yes. Maggie Sharon Dover, yes. Sharon Dover, Lancaster, yes. Karen Musto, Lexington, yes. Jeff Stula, Needham, yes. Alistair Lucas, Joe, yes. And I'm going to miss Erica when you get replaced, Erica. Yes, likewise. Very good, then. Uh, I'll see you at the other link in a minute.